Going to talk now about one of New York's theatrical treasures, the York Theatre Company. We are joined by Jim Morgan, the producing artistic director of the York, and two creatives of the York's current production, Cagney, Robert Creighton, the star, lyricist, and composer mm -hmm. of Cagney with Christopher with McGovern. Christopher McGovern. And the director of Cagney, Bill Castellino. So the York is dedicated to, I'm reading your mission here, developing and producing new musicals and preserving neglected notable shows from the past. This is one of your new musicals, Jim. How did you find it? Well, actually, uh, it came about because Bill was directing something else for us a couple of years ago. The first time we worked together was a show called Ian Escapade, ah. which was a celebration of Eugenia Inesco's Wonderful. work. And uh, Bill mentioned this show to me that they had done already uh, twice in Florida, once in Canada, in full productions. And he said, I really think it's ready for a New York premiere. And I think it'd be great in your theater. And that was the beginning of the talk. It's taken, what is this, three and a half mm -hmm. years that's or something right. to make that happen. But well, that's a we're short so time excited. for many. You're so absolutely, excited. absolutely. <laughs> right. when, so, Robert, this was your baby <laughs> doing a musical about Cagney. I mean, is this because you looked in the mirror yeah. and you said, I look like <laughs> James Cagney, <laughs> so I'm going to cast myself as James yeah. Cagney? <laughs> well, not quite, but almost. <laughs> I had an acting uh, teacher at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago, who said, you remind me of Jimmy Cagney. You're kind of built like him. I know you tap danced. Da, da, da. And all I knew at that point was Yankee Doodle Dandy. It sort of, I was, loved old musicals. At that point, though, I still, no, I'd already lost the dream. When I was a kid, I wanted to be Fred Astaire, but clearly that wasn't happening. So. <laughs> that's Jeff Denman, another actor. That's right. That's somebody else. At the that's York. not me. So I started watching all of Cagney's films and reading about who he was as a person. And my, I just became sort of obsessed, yes, with Cagney, not even at that, right then, thinking about doing a show about him, but um, just who he was as an actor, and I did really feel a connection to him in a way. And then I, I met um, the executor of his estate, who was trying to put a play together at the time, and they, uh, a gentleman who was the marketing director, his claim to fame, of O Calcutta, his name <laughs> was David Joy, wrote a play, but it wasn't really a play, it was just chunks of biography put on paper, and I went through this whole audition process and uh, went upstate and auditioned for Marge Zimmerman and all of Cagney's friends. Floyd Patterson, the world champion boxer, was there and all his neighbors. And, and Marge Zimmerman had been Cagney's caretaker. Caretaker right? and then like. ultimately the executor of his estate and Cagney left uh, his estate to her. Is the Cagney um, image trademarked in any way? I mean, you can't use a Marilyn Monroe image. Is the, is the Cagney estate, do they protect the Cagney image? No, mostly we deal with Warner Brothers in that regard, mm -hmm. um, but the Cagney estate is not really involved, and um, I've, I know a granddaughter, great-granddaughter, and have reached out and stuff, but they're not really, we fall into the tribute category, so. <laughs> um, oh, well, that's good. What was your attraction to uh, this uh, musical about Cagney? Well, I got the call from Chris McGovern when he first got involved with this, and I had done a couple of shows in Florida, mostly new musicals, mm -hmm. and they said they were looking for somebody to work as a dramaturg and as a director. And when I looked at the material, it was, this is so provocative, because I don't think I knew more about Cagney than your average bear. But I, but I learned uh, reading the script, and then you meet Bobby and go, oh, well, this is a good idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, this is an actor who was born to play the role. And when that started working, and as an author, and working with the writers, it just seemed clear that this was a story that needed to be told. As I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, did Cagney have a dark secret? Well, that's the right question to ask because <laughs> often we're saying, gosh, we wish he were more messed up. It, we could, the, the drama <laughs> would sort of unfold in its own way. But I think because of his life being so, in a way, blessed and because of his devotion to his craft and his excellence as an actor, we were forced to find another way of exposing a conflict in the show. And I would say it became blessed. He started uh, born on the Lower East Side of New York, That's which right. is yeah. one of the things that excites me so much about telling this story in New York. Um, born on the Lower East Side, uh, dirt poor, worked four jobs all through his teenage years, you know, just to support the family, a, a, a strong Irish mother, a father who was a lovable guy but at the bars and not really involved in supporting the family, um, and got his first job just because it, he needed a job. It was a show called Every Sailor on the Upper East Side on East 81st Street. It was a holdover from the First World War. It was a bunch of guys dressed in drag, and Cagney got this vaudeville job because he was a pretty good dancer and could yes, imitate. Where did he stuff. learn to dance? Well, he just knew on the street, like he had learned the Peabody from his mother and <laughs> knew, you know, he would, he, one of his great skills was he could look at a step and then imitate it. Mm -hmm. And that's how he learned to dance. He didn't take classes or anything early on. 
had he ever been a thuggish kid or no? Well, he was a fighter, definitely. He like, was a fighter, yeah. If you read his book, Cagney by Cagney, the first 30 pages are all, every other page, he's talking about a street fight he had or sticking up for his <laughs> brother or going to knock on the door and waiting for the guy's nose to heal so they could pick up their fight where they left off. I mean, Did, did he want to be a more of a song but, and dance man? But he, he want, did not want to be pigeonholed as a gangster. That's right. He felt like a song and dance man and an artist and wanted to put that in the world, but was pushed into this persona. And what really happened um, in meeting Bill and Christopher, we had, were telling the story in a certain way, and then Bill came along, we sort of broke it down and built it back up with these finding because Bill started asking these questions well he was married to his wife for 66 years he wasn't yeah. a drinker he didn't have had the Oscar he, he was an Irish rich. guy who didn't drink <laughs> yeah, exactly. but he gets the that Oscar for that Yankee Doodle that's Dan right Yankee funny. Doodle without being a spoiler about our yes. play I, it's important to notice that he sort of got consumed into the Hollywood story and he sort of woke up one day as we tell it and went wait a minute I'm not proud of the character that everybody thinks I am. Right. Uh, there's somebody else in here that has not been, you know, because in those days, stars were really stars. I mean, they, they were nobodies that got taken off the street, and before they knew it, they were remodeled by the studio yeah. and, and managed by the studios, packaged by the studios, in a way that, you know, is probably you know, more common now. But they weren't paid enough, you said to us earlier. Well, yeah, the stars didn't get the kind of money that That's right. Well, Cagney they, they started on a $400 a week we went out on a three-week contract tryout, and then uh, he signed a, I think it was five or seven-year contract for $400 a week, and would make films, you know, he's making five and six films a year, his first five years, and then Public Enemy came along, and overnight he was a huge star after right. that. But he kept working in the factory system, even though his films, like he's one of the biggest stars all of a sudden, and his films were making a couple million dollars, and he was still getting- Still $400, right. that's right. Oh and finally, he, said I've had enough of that and he literally walked out of his contract and left and Warner threw a fit of course as you would but it threw the legal battle Cagney won and came back with a new contract and you could see how the union idea comes into this uh -huh. is one of the themes sticking up bonding together there was no union then right. and there's some connection we think about his sticking up for the little guy whether it's on the street or sticking up for his brother or speaking up for himself to a studio head which took a lot of and ultimately of all the actors that's correct well, Jim I wanted to ask you um, when was uh, the York Theatre founded, and what was the inspiration for it? 1969, uh, Janet Hayes Walker and a group of other actors who had worked together in regional theatre decided to create a theatre in New York that they had some, where they had some say in the shows they were seen in in New York. Um, and uh, the, they didn't do musicals at all, actually, till I was around. It was my passion. But Janet had an incredible background in musical theater, music yeah. and musical theater. And so out of discussions that we had, we began doing one a year, um, always rather esoteric, um, shows that were not being done elsewhere, shows that deserved to be looked at again. And then when we moved downtown to St. Peter's in 92, um, uh, we began focusing more on the musical end of things, um, and our focus became new musicals, and the, the older shows were done in our Musicals and Mufti series, mm -hmm. uh, where we've just celebrated our 100th production. You have a remarkable track record, and I was stunned when you told me that you have been at the York Theatre for 40 years. It was all just happenstance. My aunt and uncle went to Church of the Heavenly Rest, where we used to be, and yeah, Fifth I asked Avenue and Fifth Avenue and 90th Street. That's what I remember we, going up there. Yeah, we yeah. did a lot of shows up there. Right around the corner years. from where Cagney. 25 years. Yes. Up incidentally. Yeah. Just and you know, we grew up in Yorkville, yeah. Oh, okay. 79th Street. You're doing the set for Cagney. I am. I am. I How do a lot of the scenery. You do a lot of the scenery. Yeah. You've drifted, you say, more toward musicals now, but do you, you, will you still do plays or no, non musicals? For, for the last almost 20 years, we've done nothing, nothing but, musical but musicals. Theater. We specialize in that. I thought it gave us a niche in the marketplace that we didn't have. I think it made it clear who we were and what we did. Really what's put us on the map are the recordings that we've done. We have right. almost 40 recordings of the shows that we've done. What are some of the productions you're most proud of? I know you love all Cagney. your children. Yeah. Cagney. Cagney. Hello. What are you going to say? Yeah. My We're most sitting right here. ever. <laughs> um, various ones in no particular order. Yank, uh, the oh, musical of musicals, Souvenir, mm -hmm. Revivals, uh, uh, Sweeney Todd that moved to Circle in the Square, also known as Teeny Todd. Right, that uh, was the strip. Specific overtures. You were doing these stripped down bear versions of things yes. before John Doyle came along. That's exactly and stripped right. Stripped them all down. <laughs> in fact, early on, uh, 80, 
seven, I believe, Betty Comden, Adolph Green, and Cy Coleman came to Janet and me and said, listen, you all are so famous for making big shows small. Will you take 20th century and prove it can be done small because no one is renting it? We're afraid people are never going to do it because they're afraid of it. Hmm. And so we agreed to do it. It was the first time we ever asked for enhancement, and we didn't. It was a big hit. It almost moved commercially. I remember, um, yeah. Well, if you haven't been to the York Theater, viewers, you should get there for Cagney. Tell the address again. It's, uh, we're at 54th and Lexington in St. Peter's Church, right on yes, the corner. Yes. Uh, you enter on 54th Street. Uh, the previews begin May 19th. We open May 28th, and we run well into June, Wonderful. almost to the end of June, and Wonderful. we hope to extend beyond. And do you take Cagney up through to the end of his life? Those, those years where he lived kind of reclusively up in his house and... Uh, no, country. really, we're at the Lifetime Achievement Awards in 1978. So he would have been, he was born in 1899, so... Uh, and then we go back to just as he was getting into vaudeville, mm -hmm. sort of working, you know, on the streets. There's Rick Sordelay, the, the Broadway fight <laughs> director. Yeah, yeah. Perfect for a Cagney musical, Rick. Yeah, and we have a fight that the audience is going to hold their breath about. And then uh, from there we go through vaudeville, Broadway... Uh, briefly, and then out to Hollywood, and sort of the representative of the factory mm -hmm. system you were talking about, um, which Bill came up with a wonderful storytelling way of do that. The writer's room and involves a lot of tap dancing. And Speaking of tap dancing, there's a lot of tap dancing, <laughs> <laughs> a lot. and there's Josh Bergas doing my, our my, choreography. My quads are seizing as we speak right now. I just <laughs> we ran here from rehearsal, so and I hope you got a couple of Tommy guns in there. Oh yeah, you there's think? guns, and, <laughs> but it goes up then until th through sort of white heat. And that's sort of where, the, um, in his in his filmography, that's sort of where we end. Can so. you say "Top of the World," Ma? Yeah, I say it very uh, loud in the show. <laughs> All but right. he, but he, you know, he never actually did say uh, "You dirty rat." Oh, <laughs> he said, but he did say "Top of the World." You know, I'm not gonna. All right. You gotta wait for <laughs> it. Don't I can't. Give it away. I gotta. <laughs> be a, you gotta pay for that. And you know, Cagney yes, when sir. Cagney won his Oscar for Yankee Doodle Dandy, yeah. and he always said in interviews, when if you read them. They asked him about imitating George M. Cohen. He said, I don't believe in imitation because then you can only do what they did. Yeah. Uh -huh. You imitate. You can't. He said, you take their essence and I, and I dance like him and then I do, tell it, I do it for real. I tell the truth. Look him in the eye and tell the truth. That was his big acting advice. That's all you need, really. And so I take his advice in playing him. I, I take his essence. I've watched and read everything about him you can and then I just play it for real. So. Well, what a pleasure to have you all. Robert Creighton, we'll see you on stage in Agni, directed by Bill Castellino and overseen and designed by Jim Morgan. The Jack Warner of the off-Broadway <laughs> theater world. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.